Well, good morning, church. Let me uh, add my uh, own New Year greeting to you, to your family. Uh, gosh, aren't you just glad when the calendar flips over to a new year? I don't know. There's something about the holidays, personally, that just invites some introspection and reflection, and oftentimes I find myself thankful at the close of a year uh, that the calendar has has flipped over. So uh, I know many of us over the last few years have faced uh, some crazy, unexpected uh, moments and times, and I know that for many of us that's, that's different in our own ways. And I, I also realize as I kind of have reflected back over the last uh, little bit that that's also been true for our church. Um, here are just a few things that I have thought about just by way of review. Uh, in early of 2018, our church introduced the next initiative where we were gonna repurpose uh, the lobby, re remodel the, the worship center and repurpose the lobby and we introduced some spiritual components as well where we would read the Bible and pray together and have gospel conversations. Well, in February of 2019, we started that whole process, which means that we uh, worshiped in two places on Sunday morning, uh, four times each, each Sunday. And in June of, of all of that construction, uh, our church planned and executed the, the pastor's conference for the whole Southern Baptist Convention down at the, the BJCC. And then in September of 2019, same year, we moved back into uh, the worship center, uh, and it was great for about six months until you got to 2020, and after you know five or six months of worshiping in here, this thing called COVID-19 happened, and we were all trying to figure out what is going on and how do we live uh, in this new normal, unprecedented circumstances, all of the words that we've all heard for the last few years. So moving into 2021, last year, uh, we knew COVID was, was still around, we were still dealing with it, but we learned in January that we were gonna have a pastoral transition. And so in August, uh, we said thank you and goodbye to Danny, and in September, we said welcome uh, to George and, and the Wright family. And so now, we're looking into 2022, and I don't know about you, but, but personally uh, for me, uh, I'm, I, I even hesitate to say this. I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic about 2022. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're feeling still skeptical or uh, concerned. Uh, we, we all have our own expectations for what this next year uh, is, gonna, is gonna hold. Maybe the pandemic is moving into the rear view. Maybe it's not, who knows. I'm hoping we'll see a return to more regular patterns at work and school and church, uh, all of those things. I'm eager for what the Lord's gonna do personally in, in my life, for my family, uh, and, and for our church family as well. And so with all of that, all of that building expectation, anticipation, the hopes, the opportunities that come with the new year, it brings us to our passage uh, for today, Psalm 127. And I think this passage is really helpful because it gives us a reminder and a caution uh, about the plans that we are making for 2022. So I wanna read this passage together, and as, you, as we do, I wanna invite you to stand, um, and, and if you're willing and able. And if you're new to Shades or wondering why we're standing, um, we stand because the Word of God is the foundation for the people of God. It's the light to our path, the lamp to our feet. It, it shows us the way. It reminds us of who God is, and what he's done. And the word of God speaks to us everything that we need to hear and heed. So with that, let's read Psalm 127, verses one and two. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this word, for your word. We thank you that you are faithful and true to your promises. We thank you that you have given us 
this word to be food, to nourish us. We don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes from your mouth. And so as we approach your word today, we pray that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts, that we might know the hope to which we have been called. And I pray, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. You can be seated. Thanks for, for standing with me. Well, you'll, you'll notice uh, at the very top of Psalm 127, just under the heading, uh, that it says, a song of ascent of Solomon. And uh, this is um, one of 15 psalms of ascent from Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134, 15 of them. And these are songs that the people of God would sing as they journeyed, as they ascended up the hills uh, to the city of Jerusalem and very likely to the temple. And they're, they're songs of hope. They're psalms of expectation. They say things like, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They will not be moved. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. So there are 15 of them, and Psalm 127 is smack in the middle. Seven before it and seven after it. And as the central song of ascent, I think it, it speaks an important word to the people of Israel uh, for what they're about to go do. They're about to go to Jerusalem and they're about to worship in the house of the Lord. And I think in the same way, it also holds three important reminders for us as we begin a new year with new hope and new expectation. And ultimately, I think we're gonna see Psalm 127 modeled in the life of Jesus. So with that, uh, the first thing, the first reminder I want us to catch from Psalm 127 is this. Human effort without God's providence is futile. Human effort without God's providence is futile. The psalmist here in verse one makes two statements to the same end. Statement one, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Statement two, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And the psalmist is, is navigating a real delicate balance here between human responsibility on one hand and divine sovereignty and providence on the other hand. What does it mean for the Lord to build the house when very tangibly there are actual human beings physically building the house? What does it mean that the Lord is the one who watches over the city when very literally there are humans walking around the walls of the city, guarding it and trying to watch for, for an attack. Well, the psalmist here, Solomon, understands that things operate on two levels. There is human responsibility. We do build and we do watch, but there's another level. There's the divine level. And if we see things from the divine perspective, that always is, is emerging from a place of faith, a place of deep trust that God really is good and that, that he really is not just sovereign over all things, but that his sovereignty has a purpose. And that's what the word providence means in, in this first point. Human effort without God's providence is futile. There's this old teaching tool uh, called the Heidelberg Catechism. It's a question and answer kind of, of tool that, we would, that, that the church would use to teach young people, the faith. And this is, uh, I, I love how the, the catechism explains providence. This is how, how it does it. The question is this, what do you understand by the providence of God? And the answer is this, the almighty, ever-present power of God by which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, 
riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Solomon understands God's providence in a very tangible way. He was the son of of King David, the great king, the heir of God's promise to David. And you may remember uh, in the story, at the end of David's life, David wanted to build a temple in Jerusalem to the Lord, literally to, to build a house for the Lord, but God would not allow it. And God actually turned the promise around on David and said, no, you're not gonna build me a house, I'm gonna build you a house. And in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14, this is what God says to David. He says to David, when when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up an offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Solomon, the the heir of this promise, he's the one who would build the temple in Jerusalem, but he only built the temple because God planned it. God is the one who is establishing kingdoms and establishing the throne of his kingdom. He understood, Solomon did, that, that God governs all things, not by chance, but by his good fatherly hands. He knew that all of his building efforts were in vain unless the Lord oversaw it, unless the Lord quite literally filled the temple. It was empty. And he knew as the king and the leader in Jerusalem that all of the military might that he could muster to protect the city was pointless if God was not with them, if God was not providentially governing and guiding all things toward his good and glorious purpose. So for us, as we look and plan and hope and dream towards 2022, Psalm 127 is a helpful reminder for us. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We may have great plans for 2022. You might literally be planning to buy or build a house. You might be planning towards marriage or towards a family. You might be hoping for more responsibility at work. You might be looking for what's next for you at school. You might be preparing to graduate from college. Whatever it is, you you know the things that you are hoping to build in 2022. So let Psalm 127 remind us here that all of our effort is upheld. It's governed by God's good fatherly hand. And if it isn't, that we might end up at the end of 2022 wondering why our plans and why the things that we've built seem and feel empty and hopeless and pointless. And that brings us to reminder number two that we need to catch from Psalm 127. Number two, human effort performed in our own power produces toil. I so appreciate that verse two is in this psalm, because if you needed any proof that the biblical authors lived in a real world, in a real place, they had real life experience, verse two is it. The psalmist says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go to sleep late, eating the bread of anxious toil. When you've got extra work to do, which way do you trend? If you're like me, you feel like you can conquer the world after dinner, staying up to the early hours of the morning, no problem. Or if you're like my wife, you feel like you can conquer the world before breakfast. I don't understand, but she can. But either way, right, our our most natural response is to lengthen the day. When our efforts come up empty, What do we do? We double down, we work harder, we lengthen the day, we add hours, we work through meals, we burn the candle at both ends, we get up early, and we stay up late. And the psalmist here is reminding us that all of our human effort performed by our own power, in our own strength, in an attempt to lengthen the day, only produces toil. 
All that rising early, all that staying up late only gives us the bread of anxious toil. Isn't that, that phrase descriptive? The bread of anxious toil? If, if you're a, a perceptive Bible reader, you may hear echoes here of Genesis chapter three. And if you started a Bible reading plan yesterday, there's a chance you might have read this already in 2022. But when Adam and Eve take the fruit in disobedience to God's word, they receive pain and toil in their labor. Eve receives pain and toil in her labor of childbearing, and Adam receives pain and toil in his labor of working the ground, and and he would eat bread by the sweat of his brow. And so here again, Solomon, I think, is reminding us that any effort done in our own power apart from God's providence, is only gonna produce toil. And all of our attempts to lengthen the day or to manipulate the day is only gonna produce anxious toil. Anxious toil. Do those words tighten your chest a little bit? Does your life ever feel like, like that? Anxious toiling, restlessness, frantic, ceasing, unceasing, always on. I can't remember who exactly said this, but somebody was commenting on our society and said uh, there are kind of two different kinds of work and we've kind of lost the marker of a good day's work. So some people do skill work, right? And and those in, in a skill industry, they can look at the hay in the barn, they can look at the widgets on the shelf and they can say, ah, that's a good day's work. But a lot of people these days are doing knowledge work, working with information. And I I think it's hard for for people in knowledge work to have the marker of a good day's work. You can't really look at the widgets on the shelf or the hay in the barn or whatever. And so I I think a lot of of people try to compensate for that by just like being always on, always available so that they feel productive or seem productive to their their bosses. And I would just say like Psalm 127 is an encouragement to us that we can change that pattern in 2022. Psalm 127 is a reminder that, that and, an, and an encouragement to us to set good boundaries in our life. Or if you already set boundaries, it's a reminder that those boundaries that you have set are good and that we should try to stay within them. I, I am so thankful for Solomon's perspective in this psalm Uh, You you may remember, too, that Solomon has also written uh, another book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes, and in that book, he just says he's tried everything. He has made a lot of money, he's partied, he's worked hard, he's built great things, he's had lots of children, you name it, Solomon's done it, and he says at the end, it's empty, it's vain, apart from God's fatherly care, apart from his providence. And I'm thankful that Solomon's voice from centuries past speaks so directly and pointedly to our place, to our place in time. And so try as we might in 2022, all of our striving, all of our toiling, all of our early mornings and sleepless nights will only earn us the bread of anxious toil. But mercifully, thankfully, there is another way. God does exercise purposeful sovereignty. He is a good father. There is an alternative to anxious toil. And the last line of verse two in this psalm gives us the third reminder and shows us the better way. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Reminder number three, human effort anchored in God's love yields rest. Human effort anchored in God's love yields rest. I think this this last line of verse two is a beautiful reminder, a warm invitation for us that a life of faith resting in the providence of God, the good, his good hand, 
That life works from our identity as a beloved son, as a beloved daughter, rather than working to try to earn approval, to earn God's blessing. A long, productive, hard day's work is a good thing. But a long, productive, hard day's work done from a restless, anxious spirit creates a life of fear and worry that just creates a life that's drifting on the waves of the world. But a life anchored in God's love, anchored in his goodness and his kindness and his character is steady, resolute. The life of faith might be diligent and it might be industrious, full of work that's accomplished heartily, given to the Lord, but it will be free from restless vanity, from restless toil. So I would encourage us that, that we can actually pay attention to our anxieties, to our worries, to our fears. They will tell us what it is that we treasure. They'll show us our priorities, our, our fears, our anxieties. They actually read our heart like an EKG reads our heartbeat. So pay attention to them. They'll show us where we're trying to eat the bread of anxious toil. But notice and remember what the text says in Psalm 127. He gives to his beloved sleep. And that is an invitation to a new identity. It's an invitation for all of us to just relax into the love of God in Christ for us. It's an invitation to believe from the very deepest chasms of our heart that we really are beloved by God. In the midst of our hectic, crazy life, we need a continual reminder that the Lord really is good, that he really is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We need to be reminded that for those who are in Christ, this all-powerful, everywhere-present God really does sustain and govern all things as our Father. And I think a lot of us know this, right? Intellectually, we get it. But we might be sitting there asking like, what does this kind of trust, this kind of confidence actually look like? I mean, seriously, like what does it look like to practically receive love and rest from God? And I wanna look here to the New Testament, specifically to the life of Jesus, because Psalm 127, again, remember, it was written by Solomon, the heir of King David, and Jesus, in the same way, is a descendant of David and David's Lord. He's the fulfillment of that great promise that it's actually Jesus' throne, Jesus' kingdom that's going to be established forever. Jesus is the fulfillment, the, the true king who's gonna sit on David's throne. He is the fulfillment of this promise to David. And he, Jesus, is the truly beloved son who rests in God's love. And he shows us what it looks like to receive rest, to receive sleep from his father. So I wanna show us really quickly four moments in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus shows us what it looks like to receive rest, what it looks like when we trust the providence of God in our lives. First stop, Matthew chapter three, uh, verses 16 and 17, uh, this passage is on the screen. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So here, at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, the Father reminds Jesus of his identity. He is the beloved son with whom he is well pleased. And that word of approval at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry orients everything else in Jesus' life. Every, all of, all of Jesus' ministry flows from his constant abiding in the Father's love for him. And we can hear that word too. 
All right, secondly, let's observe Matthew chapter six, verse 27. This verse uh, is in context of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is where Jesus is kind of setting forth his vision of the good life, his, his countercultural path to flourishing. And so if you look at just, just even the section headings in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you'll see things like anger and lust and retaliation and divorce and love your enemies and judge, judging others and don't be anxious. And so just even seeing and hearing those things, it makes me realize Jesus really does understand the human condition. He understands our, our anger and retaliation. He, he understands we're just like given to those things really easily. He knows our experience. He knows how we're tempted. And all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is asking questions to just peer open the curtain and let us look in on our own hearts. And in chapter six, verse 27, Jesus asks about our worries and our fears. Which of you, by being anxious, can add an hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus is a good student of humanity. He paid attention. He knows the human heart. And not only does he know the human heart, he understands the human heart. He understands it even more deeply than we do. And so when the psalmist uh, says that it's in vain that we rise up early or stay up late eating the bread of anxious toil, Jesus takes us and shows us the lilies of the field. Look at them. They don't toil, they don't spin. Yet even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. How much more would he do so for his beloved children? Jesus is showing us here with this question that our hearts are just totally misaligned. We want the wrong things. And we want them so much that we just will toil anxiously for them. Mere Christianity uh, was written by C.S. Lewis. And uh, in this book, he describes temptation uh, like walking against the wind. So uh, let, me, um, let me just read this quote. The quote, quote's on the screen. He said, only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know the strength of what it, or does not know what it would have been like an hour later. We never find out the strength of an evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight against it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows what the full strength of temptation is like. This quote is so helpful for me, right? Jesus walked the whole way against the wind and he knows the full strength of our temptation even more deeply than we do because we just give in to temptation all the time. And so all of this anxious toiling that's, that Adam started in Genesis chapter three takes Jesus all the way to the cross and where his work is not just empty toil that leads ultimately to death, it does lead to death, but it, Jesus' work uh, is redemptive. He redeems this toil through a purposeful sacrifice that leads us to life. Our third stop in Jesus' life, Matthew chapter eight, verses 23 and 20 through 27. Uh, this one is probably the most obvious, but I do think it's instructive because it helps us see Jesus tangibly living in light of Psalm 127. Look at what the text says. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And his disciples went and woke him, saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the waves, and there was a great calm. 
And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even the, wind, the, the winds and the sea obey him? This passage is just incredible to me, right? Like these fishermen disciples who have been living on this sea for a good chunk of their life, they've seen some storms on the sea in their day. And if they're terrified, it has to have been some kind of storm. And Jesus, sleeping right through it. No big deal. Why? How? How does he do that? And I would just suggest to us that Jesus is perfectly secure in his father's care for him. In the words of one commentator, Jesus didn't fear the wind and the waves or anything that they could do to him. The creator need not be restless in the face of a dangerous creation. When Jesus sleeps in the hull of the boat, he does so in confidence. (laughs) Jesus' life is just anchored in God's love. Fully confident in God's fatherly hand guiding and leading and governing all things. He will not give in to anxious toil. Don't you want that kind of life? I want that kind of life. And the fourth picture from Jesus' life is Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Jesus has shown us uh, what, what it looks like to receive and to delight in his Father's love. So he's shown us that. Not, he's also shown us the depth of our own anxious striving and toiling, right? Like all the way down to the bottom of our hearts. He's also shown us what it looks like, very practically, to receive sleep from his father, fully trusting in his purposeful sovereignty. But Jesus here invites us to experience his way of life. Come to me. All who are weary, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wants us to come to him. He invites us. He knows our penchant for striving, and he wants to free us from the relentless hurry and the anxious toil. He wants us to live into a new identity. And if we want access to the heart of Christ, all we have to do is come to him. We must only open ourselves up to him and bring our burdens to him. And he gives rest to his beloved. So what if 2022 is the year that we just relaxed into our identity in Christ? What if in five years we look back on 2022 and say, man, that year was a game changer for me. That was the year when I opened myself up to the reality that God actually does love me, that I actually don't have to work and strive for his approval that he really is pleased with me. Because it really is true. If you've trusted in the death and resurrection of Christ for your sins, then all of God's displeasure has fallen on you in Christ at the cross. That's the worst possible thing that could happen to you, and it's already happened in Christ at the cross. And in the same way, the very best thing that has happened to you has happened to you in Jesus Christ. Those very words that the Father spoke to Jesus at his baptism are now spoken of you in Jesus Christ. This is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. So in 2022, if the Lord wills, we will build and we will watch we will work, but let's do so with full confidence in the providence of God, in his good fatherly hand that's governing and guiding all things. Let's build and work and watch, paying attention to our own hearts, our own tendencies to toil and strive anxiously, 
And let's build and watch and work in 2022 with our hearts firmly anchored, deeply settled in the love of God for us because our Heavenly Father really does love us and he really does want to give sleep to his beloved. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalm 127 and the reminder that it is to us that unless you build the house, we're just laboring in vain. Father, we want to be faithful. We do want to work heartily as to the Lord. We want to, we want to do a good day's work for your glory. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would apply this word to our hearts, that he would help us feel it deep in our hearts, that you really are pleased with us, and that we work not to earn our identities, but that our identity is received, and we work from that. So help us to to work from rest. Help us to work heartily. but help us to receive sleep because you do give sleep to your beloved. We pray this in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.